you want to make? Lots. So okay, three. well then you, you got to give away a lot of equity. Even if they're just coming in, no money on yeah. their own, just... I never asked for money. What block? I mean, yeah, I mean... Give I've, gi I've given as much as 40%. Um, is that total or to one individual on... on, on, on no, I've never given it to one. Well, I mean, in total, I've given as much as 60% away. So I don't have control. I'm talking about one individual. Let's say you want to put five individuals together. How would you do that? To start, I give them 5% five, five apiece. Uh, and maybe the two key guys, uh, not an option, but where you can give them another 5%, so they get 10%. As because it grows. Then, because then, because then they, they, there's a hierarchy thing. You know, shit rolls downhill, so they, the, the guys that perceived it themselves to be senior want to have more than the guys that are perceived to be junior. And so, uh, but to me, they're all the same. I mean, I give them five apiece. Um, and I uh, and it's not an option if you do a good job. You got to pick right. You got. You got to have demonstrable talent before you ever get into this situation, right? Uh, except for the Mosbys, that uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> except for the Mosbys, yeah, they got to have demonstrable. That's funny. Uh, the uh, the Mosbys are a gut reaction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, no, they have to be. The, you know, well, I've got a lot of faith in in, in the young fellas. And, and, and they're going to have a piece of the things that we do at uh, Fire Resources. But, I mean, um, when you're bringing somebody in um, from outside, like uh, Dr. Eric White, who's our guru inventor, who was cut out of the deal years ago, I brought him back in. And I've given him, uh, uh, or in the process of giving him a piece of the deal, and and override royalty that he should have got to begin with since he was the inventor, but he was too stupid, he let it be taken away from him. And so he knows, he, I'm going to give it, you know, I'm going to pull him back in the deal the way the inventor should be in the deal. And uh, needless to say, he thinks all the his Christmases came at one time, because I have no, I, I don't need to do that. But see, the important thing to remember is the fact that you don't need to do it is what's important. And, I'll, I, and I don't want to blow smoke up the kids backside but uh, and we haven't had the pi paperwork finalized we're always late on paperwork and uh, basically that's because my lawyers are always late on paperwork because giving away equity is late on your lawyer low on your lawyer's priority list especially when he's an owner <laughs> and the lawyer we're talking about is an owner and so but I mean even all Melody because they don't believe in it it's always the last thing to happen so they figure if Dan dies or these guys get run over it won't get done it's, you'd be surprised. You tell your lawyer, I want to give this guy 3% of this deal. It'll be the last thing. He's going to have to have nothing else on his desk before it gets done. Because he, they, nobody believes in it. Even though all the big guys do it successfully, still nobody believes in it. No law firm, and you'll, go, you'll get a disclaimer letter from any lawyer worth his salt. Dear Dr. So-and-so, dear Mr. Jones, dear doofus, we are going on record as saying that it is not our recommendation that you give away equity in ABC Corporation. It is not our recommendation. Successful uh, 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 organizations have been built around uh, other than equity, and they'll give all kinds of junk. When I when I do the CEO clubs, I don't do them anymore. But I used to do the CEO clubs. I mean, I never found one single CEO that was willing to give away equity. And you think about it. They've got a little chicken shit company worth two, three, four, five million dollars. Giving away five percent of that pile of crap isn't mean spit. If I had been in the same business 10 or 20 or 50 years and I'd done nothing with the company to speak of, nothing to write home to mom about, what the hell, why not give 10 percent of the company away? What can I lose? I can't be any more on it than I've been. Why not? What the hell? I'll try, you know, I'll sleep with a hooker with AIDS. What the hell I got to lose? But you'd be surprised how difficult it is for people to get over that hurdle. It's, it's the single easiest thing I've ever done in my life vis-a-vis -vis growth. I may have not done anything else right. But when I've given equity away to guys, they will die for me. I told you, I've never had anybody put in for overtime, and I know there's laws. 
I would probably get a heart attack if I sat an overtime slip. I, I, I can't emphasize enough. When we went public, I bought the principal's wives and the principal's Rolex watches with diamonds around them. I think it's gaudy to have a Rolex watch with all the, but I, I bought them for the, and you know, and for the first couple of years that worked, the wives used to pat their husbands on the ass, go out and kill them for Great Western. I mean, you know, and and why and we and we lavish stock on them, and and it, and it worked, you know. It worked. All these guys do the same thing. But I mean, and when you give a ten percent away wrong, so what? He owns ten percent of the company, or she owns ten percent of the company. The rights are nothing. Is Florida any different? Ten percent shareholder is means spit in the state of Florida, just like California. Well, that's fine. You do real good with your ten percent. <laughs> you know, that's fine, Doc. You know, you can go have your Jesus Christ syndrome by yourself. You know, <laughs> I mean, but yet it means so much because if you when you sell the company and the whole thing about quantum leap is you're going to sell it someday, you're going to roll it over to some mooch someplace, some big insurance companies are great to sell stuff to. <laughs> I mean, because they've got the lowest form of uh, IQs, and, you know, they're right next to Cro-Magnum, man, those guys. I mean, <laughs> insurance companies are just super. Prudential's the one. The rock! I mean, when I grow up, I want to sell my company to Prudential. They're real morons. <laughs> I mean, it's... A, but when you give it to them, but then when you sell the company or you make a dividend distribution, it means a lot. It also separates, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not preaching separation of management, you know, but it separates, they're an owner, they're a partner. And I have, a, you know, in, in, I've, in the old days, and I still I have a, a number of partners now, people want to be your partner. People want to be my partner. <laughs> right, Burl? Right. <laughs> I mean, they just do. And make it, you make it easy for them. And on top of it, forget the magnanimous crap. It works. It doesn't matter about them. I mean, it works. You know, the, um, I've made more money than anybody else I know other than those guys I've, I've talked about. And uh, easier, not hands-on management, not looking at all the numbers and counting the paper clips. I mean, I'm, I'm sure almost everybody in this room has worked harder than I did to make a lot less money. I, I, I can't help but laugh. It's not funny to you, but it is to me. <laughs> I mean, it just, you know, you have a question. Yeah, you, you say just give it away because it works. Do you, do you feel you've ever given too much away? And is that possible in your mind? I've never... I could be really cynical and say, I shouldn't have given Charlie so much because he wept and died on me, but that's not right, and I won't say that, <laughs> even though I've thought it a couple of times. The, uh, no, no, I've never given away, I've given away too little a, a few times, and then I've rectified that. Because, be, you know, I give somebody this, and I give this, this other person 2x, and it, beca it becomes instantly obvious to me that the 1x person has four times better than the 2x. Hopefully I figured it out before they figure it out because then I don't want them to come to me. And I want that, you know, here's this, here's some more. And the, um, and when you're a non-public company, there's other ways. I mean, we're going to start a subsidiary. We're going to give you 40% of the subsidiary. Go run it. There's other ways. In a public company, it's very difficult to do that. So I, I gave, uh, uh, even though I gave away equivalent to equity in, in the form of options, but, I mean, you have to pay for options. But what we used to do, we used to take a check. Here, give me the check, and we'll wait till, you know, and then you, normally they sold the stock, and then we cashed the check because they didn't have money, so they wouldn't, there would be a, a cashless transaction. But, um, no, it's, it's the single biggest lever that you have. And remember, early on we said you, get, you don't get paid for what you do, you get paid for what you get people to do. And it's a lot easier to get people to do stuff, ladies and gentlemen, if they own part of the company, they own part of the deal. I have an equity pool that, you know, um, that 
that is separate from what we're talking about. That, you know, that uh, uh, my uh, assistants that really run my life for me have 5% of everything I own. You know, all the companies. There's an equity pool. Lorraine is, is a member of that equity pool. She's sitting in the back here. Leanne is a member. Uh, Lo uh, Lori, I just said Lori. Valerie is a member of that equity pool. And maybe there'll be an uh, Auntie Perkoff, who hopefully will be here tomorrow. He has a little teeny portion because he's only with me a year. But he, he did a lot of good work. And uh, the, uh, when I send uh, Lori a fax at 3 o'clock in the morning, at least half the time I'll get a fax back at 3.30. I don't know, you know, she's, a lo she's loyal to me, I mean, before the equity pool, and I don't know if she's more loyal to me because after the equity pool, I don't know that. But, I mean, the, of course, I, I've never made a mistake, bless you, I've never made a mistake giving away equity. I just don't think you can make a mistake giving away. I just don't. But see, we're trained. Remember all that preconditioned thinking? We're trained. Why am I giving, it's like that private authorship. Why am I giving 5% when I don't have to? The, the poor bastard works for you know, anyway. Why, why, because then you don't have to work, see? Yeah, then you don't have to work. I'm for making a lot of money, not working too hard. Now, Craig tells me, Mr. Hobbit says, I'm retired. Isn't that what you always accuse me of being? I'm retired. I don't work that hard anymore. I certainly don't work as hard as he does. And, but, because I've got all these people doing these things, and so I only have... 40 or 50 or 60 percent of the deal, you know, Craig, Mr. Hobbs is not playing golf five, six times a week either. Unless you're playing someplace else I don't know about, you're practicing without telling me. <laughs> and that's, that it allows you the freedom to either do more business or not at your choice. What I'm talking about is, is, is allowing freedom in your lifestyle. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike. With these equity, equity uh, situations that you give away, what do you do when this employee exits the company? Do you have buyback arrangements, or I mean, do you let I'm, him keep no, the okay. stock, or what? What do you do? Okay, there's a couple different ways. One, you tell him, fine, you own. 5% of a uh, minority interest in a private company, that's like, you know, toilet paper. It's not worth anything. Or you institute a buyback, either at book value or, 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 or something like that. I've never had to buy back any stock. Either my people stayed with me or they died. I mean, not because I had anything to do with them dying, but they either stayed with me or they died. And I've never had to buy back. I've never had to do that. Uh, the um, but you can institute or you can give them a, you you can uh, what was that? I thought that you know like in those uh, those uh, gremlin uh, movies I thought someone jumped out anyway or what you can do is say I have a, you know I, I'm not sure I would handle it this way but one way is I buy back for a dollar buy back for five thousand dollars buy back for ten thousand dollars buy back for a hundred dollars if you if if you ever leave. Uh, the, um, but see that, then they think, well then Craig will fire me when the company's getting ready to go public, Hoffman being the cheap squeeze that he is, will blow me out and give me the dollar. That's about the total of your benefit package, isn't it? About a dollar? <laughs> okay. It's not see, that high. It's not that high, yes. But see, so I, I don't think that tastes good. If anybody's got any brains, he's going to figure that out. As soon as, you know, we're going to hit it for... Uh, a grand slam, I'm going to get thrown out and I'm going to get a dollar for it. That's the kind of deal I got with Taylor. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, throw him out and he'll be carted by the sea, you know, airy fairy down there, float around with all the other morons. And, you know, and, but no, I don't think that works. But if you catch him stealing, Dan, you got to do something. Oh, well, I mean, if you catch him stealing, then you, you can have a provision in your agreement. You can write in things like that. Guy, your lawyer probably can't, but. I know, I know when they can. <laughs> now you, you can write in those things. Those are things, you know, theft, larceny, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, or you can create a giant equity pool, a general equity pool. I used to have a uh, blind fund equity pool where we have 10% of the assets and based on seniority, 
it was like you know it was like a quasi we had a pension too but so you're part of the equ equity pool after you're with the company three years or three days or three months or ten whatever the time frame is then you participate in that equity pool that owns 10 percent of the company as long as you're there dividends blah, blah, if we go public if you leave there's a buyback provision so then you can make a real generic so it's not tied to one person so if you find joe doke's stealing you know that's automatic elimination from the equity pool and then you just bring somebody else in and you can have like 50 employees in the equity pool but i mean the ownership then you keep the vote of the stock pardon then you keep the vote of the stock. oh well I, I sometimes i've given away equity i bought a guy's company for 11 million dollars and i gave him uh four million dollars in stock and seven million in cash and i kept the voting rights of his stock for five years or at one time I had a constructive trust where their, their stock had to be, I voted their shares for in perpetuity. They don't care. They don't want to vote them. And with the money, they want to vote them. Another time, I, this guy that I bought the company for 11, I originally bought the company for $10 million, and we're sitting at dinner, and I leaned across the table to him, and I said, you know, I've been thinking about the price of the company. And he thought I was going to renegotiate the deal. I don't ever renegotiate deals. And I said, I've decided to give you an extra million dollars. I'm going to give you $11 million for your company instead of 10. True story. Linda knows who I'm talking about. And his wife, who is, um, anyway, his wife said, what? You're going to give us an extra million dollars? I said, yeah, but what I want you to do with this extra million dollars is I want you to, I want you to divide it up amongst your key employees, top six or eight people. And I'm going to give you 250,000 shares of stock. I want you to do the same. I bought his company, he never distributed the stock, he never distributed the money. The key employees know, know that. See, if I was buying Mr. Hoffman's company, I said, that I'm going to give you 50 million, 20 million, whatever the company's worth, I'm going to give you an extra three million dollars I want you to give the key employees after we resuscitated him and we, we got him back from the paramedics. <laughs> You know, but see, I was trying to buy the loyalty and the camaraderie of those people. It worked even though they never got the money because they always knew. Yep. Money's the key. Carnegie said financial motive first. Nobody made more money quicker more successfully had such an impact on this country than Andrew Carnegie. When he was worth $500 million at the turn of the century, that was a lot of dough then. And then he decided to give it all away. Can you beat that? That's when he went kind of nuts, <laughs> trying to give away, because he couldn't, everything he, he turned into money, he just couldn't give it away quick enough. That's not a bad problem to have. I wish one of my relatives was kind of sashayed by then those days, you know. My relatives were too dumb to do that. Uh, uh, Mike, Mike, Mike. Did I answer your question, Craig? Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to interject that the reason why he did that, to my knowledge, is that he wanted to clean up his image because they felt that he was very greedy. The public did. The morons as you call them. It doesn't matter what the morons <laughs> say. But obviously it mattered to him in, in yeah, his sure. later years. So that's yeah, why see, he gave you know, away. When, when you get older, you know, those, those things. Like my dad talks about uh, that I was some sort of sterling uh, uh, honor student and that I never got in trouble. I mean, he's not talking about the same kid. I mean, he just, he just wasn't. I mean, I was always in trouble. And, and, and when you get older, you know, I, I'm... I, the only thing I talk about at the end of a career is the exit strategy. I'm not talking about because our attitudes will change, our, our, more, our, our values change. I mean, I'm not talking about anybody, anything like that. I know people that are trying to build their net worth until the day they drop dead, like Mr. Ormond, who again stepped out. But I mean, uh, most people don't fall into that category. And of course, most people don't have, you know, uh, the kind of track record or asset base that Mr. Norman has either. Well, when we were growing up, Lynn and I, we wanted to move into that house. That was our dream house at Bel Air. You know, it's... 
as you grow older, even as in the 20 years that Linda and I have been married, 20 plus, our values have changed about what's important, what's not, and um, certainly what's a lot of money and what's not. That's certainly important or has changed dramatically. So to the extent that Mr. Carnegie decided he changed his, his value system, it's like Arm and Hammer wanted to buy bar mitzvah. He wanted to clean up his act before he died. He died the day before he got bar mitzvah. Now, if that's not an act of God, I don't know what. Because Arm and, ha Arm and Hammer screwed everybody in the oil business on both sides of the Atlantic. If that's not God talking, I don't know what is. Because God wasn't going to cleanse his sins. I mean, gonna, yeah. He's down there, you know, pitchfork, getting pitchforked every day in the ass. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the great acts. I mean, when I, that happened, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, there is a God, you know, because, I mean, he spoke yesterday when he took old Armand, Ormond, Armand Hammer. You know, he bought the uh, little, uh, uh, you know, that uh, powder that you put. Uh, Bacon. Bacon he bought that just because of the name. Armand Hammer, Armand Hammer. He bought it. Shareholders are real happy about that. <laughs> I mean, it's the kind of thing I probably would have done too, but I mean, you know, they, they had a deal called Dan Penna or something, some company. I probably would have bought it as well. But um, have, I, have I answered the questions on this equity question? It's, it's critically important. What time is it, Ed? Okay, it's critically important. Tomorrow we're going to talk about growth and actually putting a plan together. Taking that, that doofus dream team and those doofus advisors and putting the, you know, the, the rubber on the road and, and, and building your own plan and showing you how to take it from idea to execution and, 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 how, and, and the ability to delegate. Because when you give people equity, you're, you have an infinitely easier time to delegate to them. They won't be telling you They'll be doing like this before it even happened. They would well, like John Mosby come, came to a board meeting just before his wedding. Maybe I hope that's not the highlight of my my feelings for you, John. It's been so far. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but I mean, I like that. Linda knows how much I like that. I, I mean, I like that. You know, that that was a I, it wasn't meant to be a doofus test, but it was a good doofus test. By the way, a doofus test is when you try to put somebody in a position to see how they're going to act under pressure. Because I want to see if they're going to falter and they can't suck up their pantyhose way before they're working with me. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Dan, there's, uh, the idea about giving away equity seems to have another kind of obvious benefit and it only took me a few hours to finally figure this out. Well, you, Harvard boy. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I, I can feel the education just stripping away. You're doing a great okay, job. Okay, good. Um, and that is that if, you're, if you give away if you give away equity in a company, let's say I want, my dream is to own a restaurant, okay? I don't know anything about restaurants, but if I, if I find a manager who knows restaurants and give away the equity, I don't have to know uh, anything. Uh. Yeah, very good. Hey, we got a guy back here to sell you. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. You don't know. That's why I can get into textiles. I can get into manufacturing. I can get into all these things I don't know anything about <laughs> because I give right. away and I, and I, I don't build a, uh, a dream team. I buy one. And that's, you know, all that board of directors I told you I bought and that company in the UK. I immediately gave them each 250,000 shares of stock, which is exactly 250,000 shares more than the previous company gave them. And, you know, in uh, that team, I had Governor Hugh Carey, the former governor of New York. I had the former treasurer of Royal Dutch Shell. I had the former um, Bob Dyke, who founded the North Sea, found the first oil in the North Sea and saved the UK from bankruptcy. I had a bunch of hit hitters. When I gave them that, they just all loved me. Nobody ever given them anything. Mike. Yes, sir. What did you give up in your film deals, and what happened? My wife's in the room. I can't talk about that right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, Linda. Joke. A little humor. No, we we get yeah very little. Yeah, we did not give. There are no net proceeds in a film deal. 
you know, it's like the Davy Crockett show, which was one of the most popular shows in the history of TV. Uh, Beth, Thess Parker, Beth, Beth, Beth Parker has never made any money, still suing over that, okay. We gave points, gross revenue points, which is, uh, is equivalent to uh, part of the equity of the deal. Well, you know, we give two to points. Talent. To talent? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Richard Harris, I think, got... None of them made money? None. Uh -uh. The, thing that, the, th uh, the thing that came closest to making money was his pe first Penthouse Pet of the Year awards I did with Bob Guccione. The first one. That's the closest. And it didn't see the light of day. <laughs> Remember those days, Linda? <laughs> I, in fact, I, at one of my deals, um, what was the name of that guy that in the jet uh, that rode back with you our master ceremonies? Tony Curtis. You know, well, trying to hit on my wife on yeah. the way back in my, in my. I had an. It, it was a citation jet. We called it an imajet. It was an imitation jet because. Uh, 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 seagulls could fly faster than we could, you know, <laughs> and then and then we got a citation after that. That image, we'd have to get out there like this. But that was my first plane. But you know, I learned. I made, I didn't know this. No wonder the guy was selling to me such a good price. The thing went about 80 miles an hour, you know. But uh, the uh, Tony Curtis and uh, Robert Goulet were our co MCs at that deal. Robert Goulet, and I, and I hear he's stopped drinking, but he, we had to get him on a stool like this and prop him up with a, a rack behind him <laughs> so he wouldn't fall over. Tony's drunk again. Is he? Yeah. Tony's drinking again? Okay, that's too bad. But anyway, so I've been through all that. We've been, the, you know, we rented the Aladdin Hotel, the hotel, $250,000 a day. God. Uh, why? I don't know why I did those things. God, it's unbelievable that I did those things. But I've been there. I've been those mistakes. And I, I come and I see you going to want to get in the movie business. I say, forget it. I don't. No, no. I mean, I've, there's certain things I've done already that I don't need to do again. And I can tell you not to do them, categorically. Unless you're doing a deal. Unless Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, two or three others are your partners, and you and you got piece of the gross, not the net. Forget it. I mean, forget it. If Ruben comes to you with a deal here, forget it. Unless he's got Lucas or some of these other guys, you know, because the chances of you finding Spike Lee, uh, you know, that, that happens once in a lifetime, Spike Lee. He's the black director guy, right? Yeah. Outrageous guy, yeah, okay. Nike yeah. commercials. Yeah. So, one more question, we're going to wrap it for today. <clears throat> Anything else? Okay, we'll see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. It may go over from 5, since we've got the room. I'll check. I'll be right back. And uh, thanks a lot. We'll see you tomorrow. Now, I read through the uh, comments in your confidential forms, and the uh, last night and early this morning, Pardon? Well, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. That's why I wanted you to be sitting like this. And uh, 80 to 85 percent of the audience, when you had a list one through seven, you know, God, country, family, etc., country was last. I was stunned. Country was last. A couple of people put God last. A number of you, a majority of you put friends in sixth, then country last in importance. If you put friends in sixth or seventh place, you got no problem being a quantum leaper because it doesn't matter what the morons say. Yet when I talked about that, I could see your asses pucker up. So either you're lying on the forms which is, even though the confidential forms, you're, you're either lying or you don't understand or you're dumber than I, this group's dumber than I thought it was. But there's a dichotomy there. Something's wrong. But for all these people that don't give a damn what the friends are last, countries last or friends are last, then you got, you, I mean, you ought to be quantum leapers. You ought to be leaping from the chest of your, your competitors right now. Now, that coupled with the fact that when you ask when I asked the question, do you, um, um, 
care what your friends think or uh, what your uh, competitors think. Remember that question there? Some of you said you're, you didn't care about in your business life what they thought of you as, as, as a business person, but for you personally, it hurts your feelings, so to, or, or different words, what people thought of you personally. Well, there's a big dichotomy. If you don't, if you got friends sixth and seventh on your list, but you want people to think good of you, something's wrong. You're either doofuses, you don't understand, or I mean, you're living in a dream world, but that just can't be. You just can't. You, ca you can't have it both ways. Either you care what they think or you don't care. It can't be, I care what they think, but they're seventh on my list. That's something wrong. That's why most of the psychological testing, this new testing, they just came out about sex, you know, that was published in all the newspapers. Uh, well, that's why I have very, li very little faith. What color are you? I'm a red. A red? Well, I my teeth. Yeah, we changed all around here. Yeah. Sure. I'd run at 45 miles, you know. Okay, we got to get another chair. Just sit at the end of one of these. The reds are supposed to sit up in front. Get another chair. Sit at the end of one of these tables. Okay, the other thing that was very interesting when I was going through the, um, the um, confidential forms was that um, uh, the question that said, uh, do you ever put yourself in a position where you can get, get, uh, be hurt, you know, feel some pain? And uh, most of you said no, and one said, what is, what is it? one said bullshit, I forget who said BS, somebody said BS, and one, somebody said, is this a doofus test, <laughs> which I thought kind of cute. Well, why don't you just sit at the end if that's all right? Yes. Yeah. Is this a doofus test? Um, it was interesting how many of you are at emotional and financial crossroads. Um, I mean, big time crossroads in your life. Like you're at the, 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 the V in the road or whatever you call it. Fork in the road. That's what I'm trying to think. That's exactly right. And um, clearly probably three quarters of you three quarters of you and um, <clears throat> in, a, in a braggadocious since you came to the right place because I you know that's I understand that and uh, and to the extent that I've had a uh, a great deal of success and I have had a great deal of success with a lot of people it's it's getting you down the right road uh, or bringing you to the realization that you're fine just where you are because you're not willing to pay that price to action. And don't whip yourself and quit, you know, don't beat yourself up about it anymore. I'm okay, you're okay, you know, cha-cha-cha, like the book says. Another interesting thing in the profiles were what's my dream, my ultimate dream. And um, I'm positive, this, there's four or five of you that put net worths of, uh, or liquid assets of two, three, four hundred million dollars. There's no doubt in my military civilian mind that before um, the, um, and some of you handed in the forms late. Now what I didn't do this time is correlate the th guys that said, the ladies that said three or four hundred million dollar net worth to the ones that handed them in late. I have no correlation. I got a feeling that there's, there's a statistical pattern there that the, the ones that handed them in early didn't have those three or four five hundred million dollar net worths. I'm willing to bet my uh, life on that. But we didn't, see normally we put a time stamp, but we didn't do that this time, but I'm positive. But other than that, you're, you're, you know, as a, as a group, they were between um, independent, financial independence, uh, not, having, not having to worry about money as when in uh, doing the things I wanna do, generally speaking. Uh, and there was just a handful uh, build a large organization, $20 billion in sales, $2 billion in sales, etc., etc. Now what I'm going to do, Lorraine, I want you to put down, get pass a piece of paper around because I'm going to go back and correlate the reds, the greens, the blues, etc. When your name goes by, put your name, just put the color, predominant color. If you're uh, a switch hitter, put both the, your uh, colors that are tied and go back for my own, uh, not peace of mind, but for my own uh, reasoning and go back and find out if there is any correlation. And I think there will be. I don't think I know there will be. But um, 
And then uh, the, one of the questions was, uh, is happiness, at the very end, the last question, this was the doofus question, the sucker question, um, is happiness the real thing or is making money, you know, and, and, and virtually all of you said, I want to be happy, and, but I think I could be happier making a lot of money or having money, but virtually all of you. And that's not how I filled out that form. When you were asked whether you were a realist or a romantic, all the women lied and said they were a realist. Virtually all of them. Well, I mean virtually all. Virtually all doesn't mean all. Okay, virtually all means something less than 100%. Hey, Harvard, Harvard, talk to her at the break, will you please? Okay. Uh, the guys put, uh, 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 a couple people put, put both, romantic and, and, and realist. And that's, that's, that's bullshit, but anyway. And, uh, but virtually everybody said that uh, they're were, they were realists, and that's not true. I, I mean, I've talked to some of these people, and the other parts of your forms don't correspond to being a realist. So this begs a big question now. Why is there such a dichotomy in the way these things are filled out by the one person from the first page to the last page? Because the last page is the doofus question. It's the sucker question, you know. And my experience has been because of the preconditioning that you've had all these years, the 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of your lives, has, not, has been not only wrong, but it's been inconsistently wrong. And uh, I try to look for some patterns for the, the minorities vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, uh, if their inconsistent patterns were the same as the, uh, the Caucasian is inconsistent patterns. And there wasn't any, I couldn't figure out any correlation. I had to go back and try to remember who was African-American, who, well, the Hispanic ones were easy. I mean, the, uh, and your name was easy because I remember that name. That's kind of a funky name. Not too many people named that, have your name. But, um, so even in filling out forms and that are, that are based on your business experience and your life experience, there are the great inconsistencies you know, um, it's it, like my wife would have filled out that form and she said, you know, like the, like the sign says, you know, if you don't think you can buy happiness with money, you don't know where to shop. <laughs> and uh, when I met my wife, she was, you know, an uh, airy-fairy romantic. Now she's a rich airy-fairy romantic. But I mean, sh she knows what side her bread's buttered. And what quantum leap thinking is all about is to figure out if you want to put butter on your bread, what side do you put the, br the butter and to remember that. And most people that go through the seminar circuit don't understand that. And that's why they, they, there's a lot of inconsistent thinking. This can be broken down. Quantum leap thinking can be broken down to very simplistic uh, precepts. And we're going to talk about growth today and how you put your growth plan together. Now, I also heard through the grapevine that we have one or two people. Remember, I kept on saying, how does this apply to you? And how do I take action? If you have questions, it's not my job to go around and say, do I have all my question, your questions answered? You're not going to leave here being unhappy because I don't really give a shit. If you don't ask me the questions, I don't want to see it on the critique sheet. I said that before. So today's the day. You got questions? Flap your lips. If you don't have questions, as an engineer once told me, a very bright Stanford engineer, he said, because I was uh, asked why I didn't have any questions. He says, uh, Mr. Pena, I thought questions were only, uh, you should only entertain questions when the individual, the participant, didn't understand. I understand in an unqualified manner. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> what the hell? That's, that, that, that's Jake with me. I mean, if you understand, you understand. But So, I mean, if you do, and some of you do, that's fine. But today's the day. And again, how does this apply to me? How do I take action? Now, again, because you're thinking, preconditioned thinking, you may understand how it applies to me, but you probably don't understand how to take action. What you do. Mr. Legrand understands how it applies to him, and he knows how to take action, because he's already taken some steps. The young lady in the, in the front here, um, the kid, the baby, 
uh, who figured it out in about the first uh, 40 minutes. Um, and so a number of other of you that I've, that I've uh, had the pleasure of, uh, of sharing some time with, personal time. But um, if, you, if you walk away from here after we go through this action plan part and you don't understand how to take action, after we spend a couple hours trying to take action, then, I mean, you, you've got to stop me and you've got to, we've got to talk about it and, and I'll, I'll answer as many questions as necessary. Is there anybody that doesn't understand that? Now, hmm. shoot, somebody. Okay, now, now we talked about yesterday creating your dream team, dealing with outside advisors. We talked about um, how perception is reality, how I'm perceived both in Europe and throughout the United States. We talked about clarifying your vision and, and part and parcel of that was setting goals. Are you passing that paper around? Okay. Setting goals and we, we, I gave you a goal form that I didn't use when I started but I've developed over the years. And uh, even though that there's a time frame uh, uh, column, that's, in my judgment, better used with people that don't understand the quantum leap thinking, not necessarily yourself, but the people that you work with, because they'll deal with uh, easier with time constraints. And always make the time a lot shorter than the people that report to you want it to be. If you, th you know, if this is for an example, instead of having a 30 day time frame, you give them 12 days and by God you'll see it'll come in in 12 days you give them 40 days it'll come in 40 days and and, and the uh, the old adage is you know if you want a job done give it to a busy person I mean and and that's very true okay so we talked about that and the um, now we're going to spend today talking about working on your action plan and capital raising money even though we touched upon it all I did was I went to the sections. By the, why, by the way, did some, the person return the section of the paper, the, the uh, LA Business Journal, that had all those people listed? Because it was conspicuously absent from my, uh, my pile of junk when I left last night. Uh, I mean, so um, I, I, I would like to see it back on my table, the table before the day's over. Um, and we're going to talk about internal versus external growth and how, in my judgment, it's a lot internal to have external growth than internal. Unless you have an, uh, uh, an, a business that's an anomaly, I mean, uh, uh, quantum growth, exponential growth is not impossible growing internally, but I mean, um, unless you're a uh, Dell computer or, or some, some company like that, I mean, it's very, very difficult. And if your business is in a recessionary mode, which a lot of yours is, or if it's in a mature phase, uh, which a few of yours are, uh, or if it's in a, uh, an extremely capital intensive uh, industry, which I don't think any of you are really in, um, it's gonna be difficult for you to grow internally. Okay. Now to me, growth is growing as fast as you possibly can, doing it morally, ethically and legally. Now Fred Smith, the founder of American Express, he also believed in quantum growth, but he, he didn't necessarily uh, opine to the ethically, morally, and legally, because as anybody knows that uh, has followed Mr. Smith, I mean, he took money uh, from his sister's trust and he invested it in the company and uh, didn't tell him about it. And when they found out about it, they sued him. And by the time they went to court, their $2 million each that he took was worth like $160 million. So the jury didn't think that they were damaged too much. So as, as I remember, nothing really happened. Um, but, you know, the other side of it is, as we talked about yesterday, do the ends justify the means? He did whatever it took. Now, I think he probably didn't think his sisters were going to sue him and take him to court. But they did. Women have a funny way of doing things that you might not expect. But so growing to me is growing as fast as you possibly can. 
in the dictionary it says the process of growing development. To Dan Pena and to high, a super high performance person, it's doing it as quickly as you possibly can. All of you understand arithmetic growth and the same numbers, and some of you have seen this before. Five squared times five squared equals 625. We're using the same numbers as five plus five equals 10. Big difference between 10 and 625. I grew at the 625 level. As I've said already, probably ad nauseum to some of you, I ran the fastest growing energy company in the world for five years in a row. Um, and we just grew like crazy. We, we exceeded exponential growth. Whatever transcends exponential growth, that's what we were. Um, and when you get in that mode, it becomes infectious. Your people uh, expect exponential growth. And for an example, we built an in-house acquisition team. And we made two or three acquisitions that were marginal, but we had to feed the machine. And that's why the 80s got to be a debacle in some cases because they had to feed those machines, those big machines at Donaldson Lufkin, those big machines at all the big investment banking houses, the big machines in Europe, S.G. Warburg, Rothschild. Because when you got these man-eating guys and gals on your team, you got to throw them meat. You got to put something through, through their mouth because when you have these kind of high, and these are all high performance, super smart people. And I mean, they want to be working on deals. They want to be working on transactions. They don't want to be sitting there with their thumb up their butt. And so that's why, unfortunately, a lot of these deals, in my judgment, that got done shouldn't have gotten done. A classic example, probably the preeminent example in the, in the history of Wall Street was the Nabisco deal. When they bid the first time three or four billion dollars, whatever it was, that was the right, maybe another billion on top of that, that was the right price to pay for that, that, that conglomerate. And everybody knew it. They could carry the debt service. They could sell, pay down the debt a little by selling off a few assets realistically. When it got up to 12 or 15 billion or 20 billion, whatever the number got to be, everybody that was close to the transaction knew they were paying three to six times more than the, 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 than the pig was worth. Everybody knew. But a billion seven hundred million dollars, I believe, were paid out in commissions and fees. 1.8. Is it 1.8? A billion seven hundred million. That's close enough. It's close enough for penny government work. I mean, and remember, I told you, and that deal closed at the end of the year. I mean, the people had already spent that money. The Kidder Peabody guys and the Merrill Lynch guys had already spent that money. They had already bought those things. That's why you go to them at the end of the year. I don't want to go into that again, like I told you why you go to financial institutions at the end of the year. Uh, Jim, um, we've got them split. The reds are up here. The greens are where? Right here. You're green, right? I was red. You're red, or oh, you're red now. Shit, in, a year ago, he was a green. Okay, the uh, blues are here, and the yellows are here. Okay. And, and except for the people that are later in the back, and so they're, you know, We've got a couple of the, uh, the uh, uh, one-fourth of the Mexican morons and two of the Harvard uh, doofuses in the back there. For those of you that want to talk to a Harvard-educated lawyer that uh, doesn't have much experience, he's sitting right back here. Raise your hand, Roll. Yeah, right there. He's one of my doofuses. No, no, I don't want to insult the Mosbys. They're my doofuses. These guys are... I've got to come up with a different name for them. So... Dilbert. Pardon? Dilbert. Dilbert. No, okay, maybe. So... That was a classic example of, of quantum uh, 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 thinking about not only uh, revenue generation, but because quantum thinking can also follow the fee and commission rational line of, line of thinking. And that's what happened to Wall Street in the 80s and the early 90s. And um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I had already been gone from Wall Street a long, long time, so I probably would have gotten in trouble if I was still there. It's a sudden, highly significant advance and breakthrough. Remember how I talked about and how the young lady said, I guess I'm going to have to get out of this business. It's, a, it's completely walking in a different direction. For those of you that haven't thought about selling your business, if you haven't, for those of you that haven't thought about going public, and the, the, the top of the bull market is here. It's, I don't know if it's going to last three more months or two more years. I don't know. But I can assure you this is the top. Because they're taking shit public that... And I've been through two cycles. Some of you haven't been through one cycle. 
And I mean, they've taken stuff public, you know, they'll be, they'll be taking the flower shops public pretty soon. I mean, you know, push carts. I mean, flower push carts. I'm not talking about flower shops. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike, Mike. Where's the mic? Everybody think it looks wrong. Who's Mike? Who's Mike? Okay. How does that affect the guys who want to go public? Uh, it, you know, does it, it takes a couple years, a few years to do that if it happens. Well, well. It, you just have to wait to the next cycle? No, 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 no. You never wait to the next cycle. What you, what you do is you make it happen by buying somebody. See, and then when you, when you buy somebody and you know you're going to, if you, let's just say that you, we were going to buy your company. And let's just say for right now it was worth a million dollars. And let's just say, for, to make it simple, that he, that, that he makes $100,000 after taxes a year. So right now, you're, they're taking companies at public to 15 times earnings to 50 times earnings, okay? Let's just say that 20 times earnings. So, so pardon? Oh, so uh, we're gonna pay him. Now, in the public arena, they do that. Now, in the private arena, you, you buy companies for six, eight times cash flow, and I'm not gonna get the difference between cash flow and earnings, but let's just say, we could buy his company for $5 million, but he negotiates hard and he, we, he winds up getting eight. Who cares? We're going we're gonna to spin it off at 20 times. So instead of the, making the difference between five and 20, we're going to only make the difference between eight and 20. Who cares? Most people in this room would care and they would beat and lose the deal over it. If he wanted 12 million, if he wanted 15 million, I don't care. Let's just get him in. Yes. So what's a company that's uh, uh, earning $5 million worth on taking public? Well, it depends on the industry. If you're in the coal industry, you're worth 8 to 10 times earnings. If you're in a high tech, uh, you're probably worth 25 times earnings. If you're in the service business, you're probably worth uh, somewhere between 10 and 16, 18 times earnings. Who determines this? Well, the marketplace determines it. it it's where the marketplace is. Right now, the companies are selling for multiples that are the, uh, the highest in recent memory. Remember how they said recent memory? They're always the highest in recent memory, but they're the highest in the last 10 years. Um, uh, Glamour health care companies are at the higher end of the continuum. <coughs> Telecommunication companies, you don't even have to make any money because, you know, they think Star Wars and they think they're going to be beamed up and all that crap, and I'm not going to live there. That won't happen in my lifetime. But yeah, I always like a business that you can't get, get a hold of, as they say in Texas. You can't get a hold of the numbers. I like an amorphous. I like mercury that's slipping around so you can write anything about it and not be lying. That's what I like. <laughs> you know, I like it to be just kind of rolling around and you just can't get, grab it. Yes, ma'am. Dan, when you're saying earnings, are you uh, saying net earnings or gross earnings? No, no. Uh, After-tax earnings are always net. After-tax. Now, it's interesting. One of the reasons I went to the United Kingdom is in England and Europe, they don't care about after-tax earnings. It's everything's pre-tax, and there's a reason for that, because they know everybody cheats on taxes. So they pay on multiples of pre-tax earnings. I was, uh, and it was a mitzvah. I mean, I so, you know, as soon as I saw that, because of my Wall Street background, I knew I had a, I had a home. I mean, this is my kind of place. They're still doing that? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, because they know. Now, because I was an anomaly there, I was a U.S. reporting company that had uh, conformed a U.S. GAAP, General Accepted Accounting Procedures, that was reporting in the United Kingdom. So we had our, our numbers, Coopers and Library had our numbers laid out just like an American company. Then in the annual report, we have a summary of the numbers. And then it would say, above the line, below the line. That, that, that's what they mean by before tax, after tax. And we'd show, you know, all this above the line stuff. And that's why we paid our, our um, bonuses out of b before tax profits instead of after tax profits. Sometimes our bonuses were more than our after tax profits, which you, you couldn't get away with if you were, list you could do, but I mean, the shareholders would get all upset with you. And, but we had all you uh, UK shareholders except for a few of us, myself included. So you, you, it doesn't matter what you pay this guy if you're going to take it public. I mean, within reason. I mean, you don't do like KKR, KKR did and pay six times what the company was worth and it'd have it be a, a great debacle. That's not what I mean. But the minutia, the micro stuff isn't as important. It just isn't. And that's why, you know, going public with America is all about. I mean, they're creating capital. I don't know how many tens of hundreds of millions of dollars that Michael Milken created in the market, but he did.
he created hundreds of thousands of jobs. That's why all those CEOs got up and testified for him in the trial. At the end of the day, the judge, you know, didn't give a damn, but the, um, he created a lot of jobs. He created more jobs, I believe, in this century than any other man has. Is he still in jail? Michael's out. No, Michael's teaching at the Anderson School at UCLA Graduate School of Business. That's where he's teaching. Is he doing deals? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I've seen him at the market in Encino. Yeah. Yep, he's still, yep. Is he not, he's not wearing his toupe anymore, right? Uh, no, no. Yep. He shops at Gelson's. Yeah, sure, he just lives above there. <coughs> or below Gelson's, not above. Okay, so this is, we want you to come up with a breakthrough strategy this afternoon, today and this afternoon, on how you can make your business grow and what you can do with it. Physicists studying quantum mechanics note that particles make these jumps without apparent effort and without covering all the bases between the starting and ending point. I had a guy who was a real PhD physicist who had worked on that. When I say Kennedy, you know, uh, the moon deal, he had actually done that deal. And I used to say there was tens of thousands of permutations. And he took me aside during the break. And as it turned out, this guy went to Taft High School in the Valley, contemporary, uh, uh, same age as I, I was. And I told him that Taft High School just won the National uh, uh, Olympics, Academic Olympics, or whatever they call it. And he said, he couldn't believe it. Now, this guy went to MIT, PhD. Taft, or William Howard Taft in Woodland Hills, my, impossible. They're all morons up there. I said, well, since you left 30 years ago, maybe they've bred something other than morons. But he explained to me, and he got up and he, with a chart and tried to explain to the audience, which went over like a fart in a punch bowl because nobody cared. But there were millions and millions of permutations, not tens of thousands. But that's what physics is, quantum leap. The, atoms and the neutron they just bounce all over they don't have the, the energy and that's what i want you to start thinking like and if it means turning your business over to your partner or your employees or your brother or sister and doing something else or getting rid of i mean you've got to think that way otherwise it, it will be virtually impossible for you to have quantum growth Quantum leaps require you to take an, the offensive. You can't achieve exponential gains in your success from a defensive posture. You can't remain in a passive stance and make a quantum jump. Most people in this room, most people that I speak to initially until they understand what's going on, are not, as I said yesterday, they're not playing to win, they're playing not to lose. Their whole life is based upon a defensive posture, not losing the assets they have. And the reason why that their whole life is based on a defensive posture because Either they don't have the confidence they can do it again, or they know that they got what they got by luck and not design. If you're confident you can do it again, and if you're confident you know how you did it, then you don't worry about these things. I have no doubt in all the ventures I go into that we're going to be successful. I know what it takes to make a successful my formula, not mine, the one that has been around since time began, I know what it takes. I know how to create the team. I know how to create, I know that uh, structure follows strategy. I understand that. I understand the goals don't have to be really realistic. I, I know how to motivate people. Money! I, it's, and then it's easy. I had dinner with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hoffman last night. And, and, and like I said, it's easy, I, you know, and, 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 I'm, and, and I, it's difficult for someone that doesn't know is as easy as it is to comprehend. And I mean, some of the people in this room that I've worked with for a while understand how easy it is. And they don't worry about making a mistake. I mean, because it doesn't matter what the morons say. I mean, it just doesn't. I mean, some, you know, unfortunately, some of you are going to say that the morons are your spouses, your parents your business partners, the guys you play golf with. So? Quantum Leap is a move you're already prepared to make, you just haven't done it. Everybody in this room, everybody, even the lowest form of doofus in this room, is capable of this. There's nobody. If I could introduce you to some of the people that I grew up with, they would get up here and say, we can't believe that Dan Pena, one, lived this long, let alone made any money. From the background that I came from, it's 
it's beyond, you know, even when I think about it, I, sometimes I, I give myself a reality check. I drive down to where I showed you where I used to live. Then I drive up to um, my house in, in, uh, in Palos Verdes. It's, uh, it's, you know, when I ever I have to go to a reunion, the 10, 20, and 30 year, 25 and 30 year high school reunions, they don't, I mean, they don't understand. They, you know, when I went to my 10 year reunion, they thought I all died in Vietnam. And then when I went to my 20, they thought I died from drugs. And then when I went to my 25, they finally figured out I hadn't died yet. And they, they don't understand, you know. My wife has talked to some of these people. If I can do it, you know, anybody in this room, it's, it's you know, a lot of the other high-performance people don't, t most of them don't tell you how easy it is. Because they, why educate all these people, Dan? Because if everybody gets educated, it's going to be harder. That's true. It will be. Like Candace Snow. God love her. She says, Dan, don't be coming and educating any women down here in Houston. I got Houston by the ass. I want to keep it that way. So I, you know, I cut that deal with her a long time ago. Don't go down there teaching women in Houston, which was not a good deal. One of my 30 plus thousand mistakes I made in business. But the, because uh, it just isn't. I mean, you've heard Burl talk. You've heard Whipple. You've heard the Verdeers. You've heard the tightwad cheapskate uh, Rick uh, Smith. You've heard uh, Casey. Uh, the... Um, and just, if, if, if that tight wad, who's so tight, he, look, he squeaks when he walks, he's so cheap. He's even done it. And you can figure out he's done it as cheaply as humanly possible. <laughs> that cheap, I mean, screw, I mean, he's figured out a way. The reason why he waited a year, because it took him a year to figure out how to do it cheaply. You can even do it that way. Well, that's not the way I did it, but I mean, you can. So it, it's just not, it's not hard. And you're all are ready to make that, that move. Now, I've alluded to this off and on for now almost uh, over plus two days plus is that one of the keys to putting your plan together is not wasting time on things you can't change. So that may be partners, spouses, whatever. Now, I'm not suggesting you all run out and dump your wife or your or your husband or your business partner. Sure, yeah. yeah, no, I'm not suggesting that you do that unless you want to grow. <laughs> if you don't want to grow, then you know, just, you know, then you don't have to do that. Now, but one of the things that I, uh, that I pride myself on is I virtually waste no time on things I can't change. I just don't. And um, there's a lot of things in our lives we can't change. That's why it's critically important that when you're working on your, your growth plan that we're going to develop here in the next two or three hours, that you put like a column down the right-hand side, either in your business organization, in your life, and this is the, you know, call it whatever you want, the doofus column or whatever. And you make sure that you don't incorporate those people, those entities in your change, because your plan has got to be change. If your plan doesn't show and dictate change, then something's, you're not doing it right. By definition, your plan's got to show change. Now, for those of you that are near the startup phase now, you're probably growing geometrically. You're getting ready to roll over, though, you know, on, like on, on my chart, where you roll over and stay flat. To achieve hypergrowth, you must divert avoidable mistakes and let your successes run their course. Some of you are doing some things very well. And some of you are doing some things that are hampering your success, i.e. dealing with a bank that can't take you to the next level. Okay, that's, you can avert that because that's an avoidable mistake. You now know intellectually that something should be done. Now, if you stay with that bank, or you stay with that lawyer, or you stay with that accountant, or business advisor, or whoever the hell else advises you, now that's an avoidable mistake. You can change that. You can't change that because you haven't developed the right software package, but da da da, if you're in that business. You can't change that until you develop a new deal or you buy it or, or as Gates did, put an option out. Uh, I, 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 Gates was one of my great idols and then he became even a greater idol when I found out the thing that he developed. He, got it, he, he didn't really develop it. He got it from somebody else. He paid an option or something for somebody. That's great. 
why, you know, why spend 15, 20 years doing that when you can just go buy it from somebody? Some computer nerd that doesn't know what the value is and give him 20 grand, 50 grand, that's dynamite. So there's certain things you can, you can avoid, you can change in your life, and there's certain things you can't. So to have hyper growth, you must avert the avoidable mistakes and let your successes run. It's very much analogous. If it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, in your business relationships, there's not that many things that ain't broke. So most of them are broke, so you, you ought to be fixing it. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. And concentrate on your future successes and forget about your past failures. I mean, a lot of you in, in sidebar conversations that I've heard or that have been related to me, you know, uh, have had, had failures in your business career. Some, some a few, some many. And a few of you have had some real successes. And so what, you, what human nature has a tendency to make us, what it makes us do is we spend time patting ourselves on the back and I'm all for giving ourselves a lot of pats on the back, a lot of positive strokes ourselves. I'm not so much into, I don't need them from anybody else. But I, you know, nobody blows smoke up my ass better than me. And you should be the same. But I don't dwell, and you shouldn't dwell on anything that you've done wrong. And God knows I could sit back on my laurels. I've come a long way. And I don't think of it that way. I only think about where I've got to go yet. And if you don't have that burning desire and total commitment, then... You know, I spent a couple of days in Palos Verdes and maybe had some nice food and looked at the beach and 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 I because I can't produce that for you. You know, I can help you develop it if you hang around with me or hang around with somebody like me. Now, part of this plan that we're going to develop and we're going to go over some uh, rudimentary things here for a minute. The bar, you know, there's two different ways, two basic ways. The B school's got 50 basic ways I do, but in life there's two basic ways. The boss sets the goals and everyone follows or you ask the lower level employees to state their objectives, then move the plan up to the next level until it reaches the top. Most people in this room run their business in an autocratic me method. They don't give a damn what anybody, they set the goals. And I, I'm here to say it's gotta be a combination of the, of the two. You can easily set the goals by yourself. Excuse me for screwing up your seminar. I can't record on that. Okay, okay, it's all right. Does he get a, hey, Ed, we got to give him a discount if he's part of the props now? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Is that any better? Okay. So, when I was, when I first started Great Western, I did the top. I mean, I, of course, I was the only guy there. I mean, me and a phone, it, was, it wasn't too difficult. So, but as I got, I got, I gained, acquired employees, uh, I, and because I, I learned long before that, that uh, I was a macro manager. And you know, one of the reasons I became a macro manager, because I wasn't worth a damn as a micro manager. It became uh, uh, very obvious to me. And you know what? Most of you aren't any good as a micro manager. You think you are, but you're not because not many people are good as micromanagers, period. Not just us. There's a certain mindset that can be developed over 5, 10, 20 years. You know, in City Corp and organizations like that, develop the hell out of them, right, Jim? I mean, they hire young MBAs and they shove them through the, like crap through a goose. But most of us don't have that talent if you want to call it talent okay do we understand how this applies to, to to us and how we the individual sitting in the audience put this into action is there anything that's not clear so far again remember we, we's the problem us we're the ones that screw up our business nobody else Okay. Peter Drucker, who I have a lot of admiration for, he's over at Claremont, the Drucker School of Management at Claremont, out here in Pomona someplace. Management by objective works 
if you know the objectives. 90% of the time you don't. So this, you know, total quality management and the management by objectives that became very popular in the 80s and the 90s. And, um, I mean, that works. But 10% of the time, because 90% of the time we don't know. We don't understand. And even mo a higher percentage of the time, the people that work for us. That's senior management don't know, let, let alone junior management. If senior management only knows 10% of the time, what the hell does, I mean, middle and junior management know? Yet we, especially I like when the young kids come out of the B schools, they come full of piss and vinegar and they're all fired up and they've got all these books and they can, they got their Lotus 1, 2, 3 and they can crunch numbers and all this stuff. But, you know, remember, structure follows strategy. They know how to put, you know, the structure together, but they haven't figured out the strategy yet. And as a macro manager, a macro thinker, I'm more interested in the strategy and the structure will follow, just like NASA followed President Kennedy. Exactly. That's probably one of the great examples of macro thinking in this century. And, J and Jack wasn't that bright, President Kennedy. We had a lot of brighter ones. And, but, I mean, it happened. It just happened. And when Ted Turner started CNN 10, 11 years ago, they all thought he was an idiot. They all thought he was crazy. Well, his goal is to control that medium worldwide. That's his lifetime, or not his lifetime, his goal that, to cre that, that transcends his lifetime. Who knows? We'll see. He's surely, certainly got a big leg up on it now. There's no question about that. Rick Scott's goal was to control health care. That's a pretty damn glo big global... I mean, that's a, that's a ballsy... That's a ballsy deal. But, I mean, it's a complete reversal. Rick Scott was a lawyer. One of the, in my judgment, one of the best corporate lawyers in America. He was my lawyer. He, he just turned around completely. I'm going to control the health care industry. That's a pretty damn big... I mean, it transcends big. I mean, just like Adolf Hitler, three greatest salesmen in the world, Hitler, Muhammad, and Jesus Christ. Hitler said back in the 20s at the Wannsee uh, uh, estate out in eastern, it used to be um, East Germany, now it's in big Germany, when he sat down with the industrialists and his team, he says, we're going to control the world and they put together their plan. I mean, he was a, a little former corporal from the f First World War that had been muster gassed. I mean, a little doofus guy. He came a long way. Quantum thinking works. Now, these are things in your planning, and I say CEO, but it's the senior entrepreneur, the, the owner. These are things you can't delegate, in my judgment. Not just in my judgment, I mean, a lot, a lot of smart, a lot of guys smarter than me that have come up with this. You can't delegate strategic planning the system. Cannot delegate that. That has to come out of your mind, your brains. Number two, you cannot delegate control and accountability of the system. If you put the system in, then you sure as hell got to be responsible for it. When I deal with companies, depending on whatever portion equity that I, that, I, uh, that I take, normally that function, even though I'm not the CEO, I normally take over as chairman. Normally I'm, I'm not a functioning CEO. But I mean, I can't, because I came up with it, I am the one that's accountable. I'm the one that is ultimately in control of it. You cannot delegate system to grow managers. You have to be. You have to be the nurturing. Christ had 12 disciples, and they had, I mean, so, and in my judgment, you can only nurture, you know, two or three at a time. And last but not least, and this is what I think I did the best, and does, so does Rick Scott, and all the guys I've alluded to for the last two days ad nauseum, is the care and feeding of the corporate culture. 
The CEO, the head guy, should be what I call him the glad hander. Just glad handed, looking for deals, looking for money to grow his company. That's it. That's all these big guys do. I mean, Rick doesn't even Rick doesn't know about uh, some health care deal down in Waco, or I mean, he just doesn't. I didn't know about uh, you know the my operations in West Virginia. I had, we had three three main divisions. I, I didn't know you know I didn't know we were closing offices, opening offices. You know, I didn't even know we bought uh, 300 new trucks. You know, for, in the coma. I didn't know that. Didn't want to know it. If I knew it, then the guy there. Isn't, shouldn't be there. Clyde Goins, who was the president of our coal division at the time, then we, old Clyde, and he knew that I didn't want to know it, and he's a, and so, um, now when they renamed the coal mines and stuff after me and my kids, I knew that, they, I used to, you know, they used to come down, and, you know, and I, I knew stuff like that. But uh, well, that's about the most detail I knew about the company. And, and what you find is because again, preconditioning, because of all the, the faulty knowledge that you've been given, is we, that we, we spend our time actually running the business. And that's not what we're good at. Any questions on this? People don't do what they, you expect, they do what you inspect with respect. This took me a while to learn this because I thought if you dealt with bright people, you never had to inspect or check on things. And so periodically, these top guys do check. More of a spot check. It's not like in the army where you check everybody's lockers and everybody's rifles to see if they're clean, etc. Rick Scott, I'm sure, does make spot checks and go, goes to various outline you know, four or five times a year, his operations. And I'm sure I know, and I know all these big guys do the same thing. And they normally make in conjunction when they're gonna be in to make a speech, a keynote, do something else, then they, they check. But what they're not doing is crunching the numbers and like George Verdure used to do, he'd come in on his computer every morning to see how many sales were made, he doesn't do that anymore. And it's, one of the reasons he travels so much is because it's hard for him not to do it. That's one of the reasons he didn't say that. Because I told him, get your ass out of the office then. Then you can't do it. But he said, well, I can have a laptop, Dan. And I did, because I don't even know who you could have a laptop. And I could do it. I said, well, don't carry a laptop. Because he's going through withdrawal like this. But he did. And you now look at it. They're having a lot of fun. And you'd be surprised how much your life uh, improves when you're making a ton of money. I mean, I don't know what it is exactly, like the endorphins in your body come out. I don't know what the hell it is, but just a lot easier to be happy. How often do your people report to you? I have a, I have a meeting uh, normally once every four to six weeks. With your top people. Yep. And uh, we have... Um, like uh, t uh, timelines, I don't know. What, the report, Jim, that you send every two weeks, what the hell is that thing called? Um, critical path or something. A critical path, yeah. Well, he sends it to the, the two people that report me and I, I get copied or sometimes, sometimes he just sends it to me and he copies the other, you know, the other senior people. But I mean, I don't think I've ever called you no. on what the report says. No, I never have. I read it and if I have a question on it, I'll talk to Grubbs or Tim. What's the kid? What the? What's the moron doing here? I, you know, what's going on here? But I, I wouldn't call him. Um, like yesterday, I told him to watch out for the weasel. Did you meet with the weasel? Not with the weasel. Okay, I said watch out for the weasel. Now that I, 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 I told Bud to send you a fax, and that's what he did, right? Yeah. Watch out for the weasel. Did you, you know, that he met with? And uh, but I mean, that's I get those reports. I get them from Lee Ann Zakelly on our uh, our manufacturing operation. I get them from Valerie in Scotland. Um, and I look at numbers, I get a, I get a monthly uh, P&Ls, but I don't look at them. I look at the P&Ls normally three or four times a year, normally on the quarters. And sometimes I don't look at them, uh, I've gone as long as a year and not looked at them. And because if something's going real wrong, I expect the people to tell me. And uh, if we're going to be way off projections or way off budget. See, I don't like surprises. High performance people don't like two kinds of surprises, good or bad. 
They don't like surprising good news and they don't like surprising bad news. Because if, if we get surprising good news, it's because we didn't have a feel for what we were doing. And you should, we should have a feel for what we're doing. We shouldn't have profits, shouldn't be 300%. That means that we had a misallocation of assets, we had a misallocation of people, something was wrong. When profits are up 300%, we think you're gonna be at 15. Something went wrong. And God, we don't, I don't want that. That means we could have had other people doing other things this business is easier or the margins are bigger and if that's the case you don't need the five people there you only need two we could have had these other three people running another business okay and then you know and the thing once you put the plan together this is critically important most of you take your plans that you, anybody that's had one and you put them in the top drawer of your desk and they stay there for those of you that flew here, the first thing the pilot does is check his flight plan, then when he gets up in the air, what does he do? He has to change it. If you're off 1% coming from Sacramento down here, you'd be out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean someplace. You constantly change it, and if you send a rocket toward the moon, about 90% of the time it's off course. It fails its way to the moon, continually making mistakes and correcting them. What you've got to do with your plans once you get them is you continue to monitor them and adjust them. Monitor and adjust them. Life and business, neither one are static. And what we do is we shove them in a drawer and we don't look at them. And big companies do it best. Big companies, Citicorp, have got a three and five year plan. They probably haven't made changes. I mean, because, because pride of authorship, the guys that put the plan together, if we have to change that plan, they made a mistake. It's not true. They didn't. I mean... Something else has happened. Saddam Hussein did this, the price of oil went this, interest rates had a change. I mean, something changed. And you see very little in the, the larger the organization, the less flexibility there is in the planning mechanism in changing it and adapting it and moderating it. Now some of these things may seem to you, well, guys talking about I'm just, you know, I've got I got a I got a push card here, I'm selling flowers, this is me. If you don't understand this stuff, you're going to have a fish, a, a fish or a flower cart pushing in the middle of the street next time I see you. You got to understand this stuff. Or you got to get somebody that understands this stuff. You know, one of the two. Okay. In your packet. Now, Again, the people in San Diego got this, but we're going to go into more depth today. Pull it out. You should have one of these, God willing. Now, when I first gave, started giving the seminar a year ago in May, I didn't have the handout, and I didn't put it together this way. But I got, you know, and I used to go through this just off the top of my head because I've done this so many times. I mean, I don't have to write it down. You know, but, uh, so then we, we, we put it to paper. Does everybody have one? It looks a little different. No, no, that's the four. There's the one that's attached to that should have 11. There's two of them. It says 11. It says 11 on it. It's a little different look. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, you got it. It looks different, okay. And there should be one the backup says four on it. Four step, to whatever the other, okay. Now. Now, how did I develop this? I developed it by making 20-some thousand business mistakes. That's how I developed this. I developed this getting my head handed to me in various parts of the world in business. I developed this by getting my knickers ripped off in Abilene, Texas, in, in, in Graham, Texas, in Mineral Wells, Texas, New York City. You know, that's how I developed this. I developed this because I got scar tissue all over my body and a lot of up my backside. Okay, the most crucial thing about, now this is taking an idea from an idea form to execution. And most of you, not all of you, most of you are past the idea stage. 
you had a different idea. Now, you got a different idea. And some of you may have changed your idea since you, since you walked in here. Start hearing me babble on about it. Okay, so you, you've got an idea. Now, some of you come up with ideas almost instantly, like the young lady. I'm doing something. I'm doing that. I'm not in the right place. I got to be someplace else. Some of you develop ideas over time. Doesn't make any difference. Once you've got the idea, I can normally come up with ideas like that. I mean, I don't develop anything over time. The, um, I don't know uh, if that's a right side or left brain problem, whatever. By the way, if you want uh, uh, to, to, if you ever think you're losing focus or concentration, if you go like this about four or five times and just over a couple of your ears, the, 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 um, the, the gurus say that that brings your um, the right left back into balance. I don't know if it does, but I do it all the time. You know, I don't know if it works or not, but whenever I do, at least I go like that. Okay. Um, don't hurt yourself. But, okay. Now, so I've come up with an idea. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to use, no, like this with your fingers. Hey, Craig, just turn around and hit that guy in the head and maybe help him a little. Anyway, okay. I'm going to, some of the analogies I'm going to use, I'm going to use about how I decided to get into the personal development business success, okay, business. I came up with the idea back in March, April of 1992 when I was doing some uh, lectures pro bono and somebody said on the way to the uh, Metropolitan Tennis Club that I belonged to, uh, I played a lot of tennis at the time, he says, you know, Dan, you ought to do this for real. You ought to do it for money because and this guy was a seminar junkie. He says, you know, I've gone to a lot of seminars and maybe there's maybe 10 or 20 guys that are, or, or ladies that are worth a darn and the rest aren't too sharp. And you're, you like public speaking. Make a long story short, I didn't think anything of about, about it. We played tennis for a couple hours and I'm in the shower getting cleaned up and like a light bulb went off in my head. Like those old Ford commercials where the big light bulb went off. Big light bulb and I was like I was blinded. And you know, either I was having a seizure or I was having an idea. And so... <laughs> The, uh, I thought to myself, and I immediately thought of dominating the personal development business. I instantly went to that. I didn't think about sitting down and t test marketing seminars for $89 to 10 grand. I didn't think of any of those things. But I just said, yeah, I've dominated. I saw myself walking around and you know, 10, 20,000 people in stadiums. And, and uh, that's what I thought. Okay. Now, I instantly came up with the idea. I'm a cross between Billy Graham, or excuse me, um, the guy that just... Um, Elmer Gantry. Elmer Gantry and Norman Schwarzkopf. <laughs> I instantly came up with that analogy. Didn't know what we would call it or anything like that. I called Bud Grubbs, who's my, one of my partners now, who is a consultant that I helped convince him to leave Ford Motor Company after 17 years, three years before his golden, whatever they give you at Ford for after 20 years, and he left and went out on his own and became, uh, he's, he has a specialty on uh, dealing with government on government contracts. He's one of two or three guys in the country. And the first year out, he made like four or five times more than he ever made at Ford, which he made a lot of money for. And so I says, Bud, I said, uh, I think I'm going to go in the seminar business. What do you think? He says, yeah, that'd be dynamite. He said, uh, how soon can you get over? He says, tomorrow. So he came and we sat down and we worked through three days, day and night with Leanne. And we, we, we bought one of these things where you can write on it. And you press a button and it comes out like in a, a fax machine, you know? And we worked day and night around the clock for three, three and a half days. And um, domination of the biz world, uh, this industry was at the top and then we worked down. Okay. So we had this idea and we came up with a, what we said, a four page game plan. No time frame. And then I said, okay, now I'm going to go out I got to investigate what the competition is. Just because one guy I played tennis with says there's no competition doesn't mean that there's no competition. So I spent the next six or eight months going out listening to everybody that gave seminars at the high end because I wanted to dominate the high end of the market. And if I dominated the high end, I thought I could dominate the whole market. And so that was part of my investigation process. And when I went to see these people like Jay Abraham and all these others, uh, Dan Kennedy, I hired private investigators. I found out if they had any money, if they, you know, how many times they've been sued, for what, et cetera, et cetera. And every single of the top 20 or 25 people in the industry, I investigated the hell out of it. 
And then I, when, I, when I thought I was done investigating, I investigated some more. Now, I have a, a private investigator that is part of my team who's sitting back there. And, 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 uh, but you don't need to have a private investigator be part of your team to do this. There's, I mean, there's a lot of ways of doing the investigation that you don't need someone on your, on your part of your team. But I investigated for probably four, five, six months. I did my homework. And my friend was right, that I felt confident. And I didn't know what unique selling proposition was at the time. I didn't know what that meant. But I knew that, that uh, I had made my money not by seminars, but by the sweat of my brown business in commerce. OK. Then I became committed to the idea myself. You've got to get committed yourself as an individual. It has to be your whole life. It has to be, you have to be obsessed with it. Craig Hoffman reminded me at dinner last night that he came out to visit me at the castle with his lovely wife and an, another um, uh, gentleman, uh, Kent Browning, who owns you know eight or ten car dealerships here in Southern California, Browning Motors. And uh, he said, you were really obsessed in those days because I didn't go play golf with them. They went to play golf and they went to do all these things. And a couple of nights I didn't even go to dinner with them because I was focused. And he said, you, you were, you know, and I, I was a lot more focused in those days than I am today. But I mean, I, I got focused, I got obsessed. My whole life evolved at that time around finding out more about this business. If you don't have that level of obsession, then as we go down this list for the next couple hours, not just this list, for everything that you aren't willing to do, you're dropping your chances, let's just say for an example, 10%. The probabilities go down 10, 10, 10, 10. 10 and pretty soon they get the, into the minus and then I can I can with some clarity predict whether you'll be in business three years from now in the business you're in so I get I get obsessed I make that commitment and as for people that have known me like Mr. Orman in the back room when I make that commitment I'm committed that's it no birthdays, no Christmases, no Hanukkahs, no bar mitzvahs of my friends, no nothing. That is it. Just like the Verdeers are committed now. They are committed. They are going to dominate the country in their business. I'm sure they will, short of something happening to them. Okay. Then I go, I make, with my other decision makers preliminary decision you and the other people to the extent that you depend on anybody else in your in your group to make decisions you go to them and you share this obsession up to here to four i hadn't shared it with anybody it's just it's me now if i've got like right now i have uh three or four partners i would you know share the obsession with them and as if my partners were here today which they're not they they tell you that dan's obsession whether you want to share it or not he's got plenty of obsession enough that he doesn't need you really to be obsessed it's better if they're obsessed though because my partners know that the probabilities of me being wrong are so remote because i've been right so many times that they even if they can't get up you know they can't get hot and bothered about it right now they know they'll get hot and bothered as we go down the road in your case you can't risk that because you've probably never been hot and bothered about anything before other than maybe some person of the opposite sex and that only lasted three or four or five months so so you share the obsession with your with the, your people and you live it totally and just as mr hoffman said you know i didn't go play golf and i didn't go to dinner i was i lived it totally it was my whole life now see you only have to do these things if you want to be a high performance person if you don't want to be a high performance person you could you know sleep till 10 and you know you don't have to do these things okay then i continue my investigation of this industry, I continued to go see. Now, instead of seeing the top rung of speakers, I was down to the second rung of speakers. But I was continuing to see if there was somebody out there that had a similar story to tell that I did. I didn't find such a person. But you continue to investigate about your idea, the competition, like in, in software and in the computer business. I mean, there's companies popping up every day. I mean, there's people all over the place. So, I mean, if I was in that industry, I'd be investigating forever. I mean, and by investigating, I read all the magazines, I went to see all the guys, and I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in the, com in the computer business, there's all kinds of stuff to read. 
And then it became so much I couldn't read them anymore. So that's, I immediately delegated it off to somebody else to, to do. And, I, I, and so I only read and investigate part of these deals. I had somebody else reading them. And they, at that time, it was a young guy named Auntie Perkoff. He read everything that was ever written about the personal development business, and he would send me back executive summaries once or twice or three times a month. And they would just tell, you know, there's a guy here or a lady here that does this, and sounds like it might be maybe somebody should go to see the seminar, and I'd send him. And he'd come back and says, no, she was a doofus. Don't worry about her. You know, blah, 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 blah. But continuing the investigation. Then you're going to put together your decision action plan, you and the other decision makers. You're bringing them into the decision-making process. You sit down with your, you know, if it's one person or two people, or whatever the number is that's, that, that are the decision-makers. Because it's important because ultimately these people are the people that are going to run it because you're going to step away from it. You'll step away and they'll run it. So that's why they, it's important to bring them in. A lot of entrepreneurs are off running around doing all these things and then when, if something happens to him or he has to turn it over, then the other people that are expected to run it and hopefully given the responsibility and the authority don't have the basis of knowledge to do anything. So then they make a mistake and the boss gets mad. But there's a re the reason you're mad is because you haven't brought them in early on. Okay, now you further expand. Now you, you're still working on how this is going to make them rich, how this is going to make the company to the next level, how this is going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread, that this is the greatest thing since religion. I mean, you continue, you never let up. And you walk your talk, and you never, 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 never share a doubt. Never. I don't care if the bank calls you and says they're calling the loans on your house and your car. I don't care if they're repossessing your furniture. I don't care if your mother and father and all kids get kidnapped and they find them in a ditch. I don't care what happens. You never share a doubt about a business proposition with anybody ever under any circumstances never because as I told the story many times that little bit of indecision in your on your part like I said God we're having a rocky time of it by the time I got back the deal had collapsed the other side got up from the table walked away because if the old man says we're having a rocky time of it, I mean, he obviously smarter than I am. I mean, Eisenhower at Normandy knew the invasion at D-Day could not work. Wasn't supposed to work, but they had to do something to show uh, camaraderie amongst the Allied nations. It worked. D-Day wasn't supposed to work. We read about it in his memoirs 10 years later. Rommel, I can't remember who he kicked the hell out of in the, the first, uh, uh, for whatever general, the, when he first uh, was fighting in North Africa, whoever he was fighting, Rommel was undermanned, no ammunition, Low on fuel, da 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 da. He wasn't supposed to win. In his memoir, well, he didn't write any memoirs. People that wrote about him, his son wrote about him, that well, he knew he couldn't win, but you know, but he did win. You never, share, these guys never share doubts. You think George Patton, General Patton, thought that he was going to win all those battles? No. Yet I see in business daily. On an hourly basis, when I talk to people, they have, they have not just a little doubt, they have massive doubts. And it comes across. It comes across when you talk to your lawyer. It comes across when you talk to your banker. See, and when you, sh you show them that you have a doubt, then the pressure on them to perform is a little less. Excuse me. A little less. And then when, he, when the lawyer shares it with the accountant, Craig really doesn't think that this deal is going to go through, then the pressure is a little less. And by the time the thing comes full circle, the deal is with a tidy bowl man. These guys, when Trump was fighting uh, Merv Griffin over the control over those casinos a few years ago, 
I mean, nobody was sharing any doubts with anybody about anything. It, they never do. They just don't. Because success begets success, obsession grows and becomes infectious and you make deals. The key to being a super, super high performance people is making bad deals good. That's my specialty. Bringing them back from the death. Bringing them back from the other side of that tunnel. Does everybody understand that you don't share doubts? No matter what. A mic. A mic for Mr. Hoffman. Well, this may be this may be pearly words that I'm going to put in my memoir someday. Before we went out to dinner last night, I was watching the Laker game, and at, at halftime they were interviewing the new coach, Del Harris. Chick Hearn sat him down, and <clears throat> the first 14 games of the Laker game uh, of their schedule is going to be on the road. And he says to this guy, he says, "Now, would you be happy? You're going to be on the road playing all these tough teams." You would probably be happy if you came away seven and seven, and um, you know this. This no, no way was this guy going to say, "Well, I'd be happy seven and seven. He looked at Hearn and said, "You know, I'm going to take each game at a time. I think we can win each game that way." And he said, "I would be happy being seven to seven if going into the 14th game we were we'd lost six and won. <laughs> I mean, we'd won six and lost seven. Yeah, yeah." He, wa he wasn't going to, there was no way he was going to share any doubts absolutely. about how bad the schedule was and the fact that they were on the road. I mean, it just, uh, this thing about, you know, and I'm talking about with your spouse. You don't share. You just don't. One of, my, one of the reasons my wife's uh, spending pattern doesn't change, even though I teased her the other night, you know, I haven't had any real income uh, for three years. I've been unemployed. I never collected unemployment. I guess I could have. I never thought of it, really. I guess, I guess I could, yeah. I guess there's no reason why I can't. I certainly paid into it, but I didn't even dawn on me to collect unemployment. How much is unemployment a week? Two twenty. Jesus. No, it didn't, didn't even dawn on me. Didn't even. Dawn. Is there any time limits? Can I still run back? But the. Um, yeah, I got to go look for a job though. To, okay, I got to qualify. Maybe you want to apply just so you can show them how screwed up the system. Yeah. But I mean, the reason, because my wife thinks that everything is fine. There aren't, you know, she, she doesn't, uh, she sat in on part of a business meeting I had yesterday with Mr. Legrand, and it's the first time she sat in on a meeting 10 years, maybe longer. And yeah, yeah. She, she, she thinks you're a nice guy. See, something's, uh, something's obviously, you were giving her all the bullshit, I, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> The, uh, but I, I don't share those doubts. My kids, like my kids, when, when I first got thrown out of Great Western, and my, my daughter and my son were worried about it, and Dan Jr., after about six months, he says, quit complaining. He says, has our lifestyle changed any? He asked his brother and, younger brother and sister. No. Are the, uh, this is Dan. Explain it to him. Does the house look the same? Did the castle look the same over Christmas? Is there anything missing? Do we still have the same cars? Nothing's changed. So what? Because they were worried because I didn't have a job. And so, uh, and so because Dan, because it's so important, I mean, uh, to, to keep a deal going and to keep the momentum going and to keep everybody on line. And I assure you, if your lawyer doesn't think that you think you should win, He's gonna, you know, he's gonna, he's gonna not read that brief the last time. If you got raw, he might not read the brief the first time. <laughs> yes, the, uh, Mike. We gotta get a guy, Mike. We gotta hire a guy, Mike, to run up and down with. A little guy. What are the midgets' names? First names. Uh, Greg and John. Oh, we need a mic. Okay. No, Daniel, I was just thinking of how many doubts the attorneys tried to place in you. Yeah, yeah. That, well, we're going to get to that, but yeah. You could have. It would have been so easy to buy into the doubts 
and it would have changed the whole outcome. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that we're going to talk about after the planning part is that even though I, I, I'm, I recommend highly that you hire the very best you can't afford, even they will tell you you can't do it. Because, and they will write you letters up the yin yang, protecting themselves, and you know, and I have, and I have top notch, world class lawyers. But we'll get to that. So you can't share a doubt. I mean, nobody, Joan of Arc, who's one of the only women I could work with, she was a little before my time. I mean, she sure as hell didn't share any doubts. She shared a doubt <coughs> in the, uh, when she's, uh, that scene, I don't know, I uh, forget which play it is, when she's praying to God. Maybe you can share a doubt with him, because he ain't talking. You know what I mean? But I mean, anybody else, forget. Okay, now, uh, now for me, I had never had a problem walking my talk, because this is the way I live. This is the way I act in my house. You know, somebody once asked me in one of these seminars, uh, you know, is this part of um, uh, your, your makeup, your, your seminar suit? For anybody that's been around me, my house, my kids, I, you know, unfortunately, I swear at my kids, I talk to them just like I talk to you, call them doofuses, you know, and I, I, this is just me, you know, this is 100%. So I don't have any trouble walking my talk because this is the way I live my life. Some of you are going to have to adapt like a chameleon to being this way all the time because the more you act this way the easier it becomes and pretty soon it's not an act it's reality and reality always works better than an act okay now you put together your other decision makers not you a critical path and the reason the primary reason you haven't put together a critical path Mr. Mosby is because they're going to be responsible for it in acting it and you want their head on the nail on the door. You want them to take responsibility. You want them to take the authority because you're giving it to them. So you let them put the critical path together. You let them, not you. And part of this... Okay, okay. Now... We're at the stage, we've just, you know, you, you've gotten your other decision makers and you to put together an action plan. You've made that decision, okay. Now, the next, from that action plan, you're going to put a critical path or a timeline together. And some of them have, can, can you read that? Well, not well, but anyway. Well, it doesn't say anything yet. Why do I get all these damn things that don't write? Well, give me, okay. You're going to have two. The one method of doing it is on, on, on two axes. One is time, and these are events. Another way of doing it is five days increments, seven day increments, what you're going to accomplish in these seven days, what you're going to accomplish in the eighth through the fifteenth day, what you're going to accomplish from, et cetera, going out 90, 180 days. And so then the things that you're going to accomplish in the first 10 days are listed. And obviously they're, they're listed in, 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 a, in some basis of a priority. I mean, what you've got to do here normally builds on what you've got to do three months from now. But you put together the critical path and you, you have the individuals that are going to be doing it and or overseeing it put the critical path together, put the structure together, because you, well, first of all, they understand what needs to be done best, better than you, because they're doing it. If you understand the critical path better than they do, something's wrong, because you're not doing it. If you understand, this is one method where you put time down here, okay, and you can put 10 day increments, 10 days, 20 days, it could be months, it doesn't matter, you know, out you know, 180 days, and then you have items, item one, two, three, four, and certain things will overlap. So by your end of this project, by the time this project ends, you should have already started this deal, you should be in the third or fourth day, and the third item you're not going to start till four or five days until you finish the second item. And the, the, oh, this would be fifth item, and then the fourth item, you're doing the same time as all of them, because you're, let's just say, you're putting a prospectus together. 
See, the prospectus is being worked on during the whole time frame. And then down here, the fifth item, and this could be the accountants, the lawyers, printing, etc. And you put a timeline, you have them put a timeline together. Uh, uh, Mike for, um, for Bruce. Now, engineers know how to die, do timelines, critical paths. MBAs know this kind of stuff. Right, well, Bruce? Absolutely. The, uh, when you first did that for Great Western, you did the first timeline yourself, and then part of that was to uh, get a group of people you could have do another critical path? No, how did you handle I, that? When I put the critical path together when I first found a Great Western, I, it's like pointed, I pointed at the moon. I said $2 billion and the top uh, energy executive uh, five years in a row, we're out of five years, five years in a row, I think it was, and that was it. That was my that was my grandiose critical path, just like we're going to land the moon. Okay, man on the moon. Now, as I brought people in, then it's just like when I said when I started in this business, I want to dominate the industry. That was it, dominate the industry. I didn't say timeline. I didn't say when, where, who, how, what. When I came in and there was more than one employee, and we had three or four, or five employees, then. That's the stage we're at now. You get together with them, and then Charlie and Mark put the critical path together. Charlie and Mark were my two uh, uh, co-founders that I gave equity to. Gave, wrote, signed over, did an option back, didn't... You know, I thought about the questions yesterday. Let me get off on a, on a tangent for a second. The questions, what do you do when you have to fire the guy? What do you do when the guy winds up being a doofus? What do you do? Remember all those questions? The more I thought of that, the more I should have said to you, that's the glass is half full, not half empty, or half empty and not half full. That has never happened to me in, 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 in my career, ever. It's never happened. And, I'll, and, and it's not just because I pick right people, because I pick some doofuses. But at the end of the day, it didn't matter that I gave away equity to people that were no good. That's the answer. I made so much money so quickly, and the other people basically squeezed those people out that I made a mistake on. It ultimately didn't matter. It just didn't. Because we were going so fast. Remember I said there was a, a slide yesterday that the uh, uh, um, uh, revenues overcome even uh, 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 mistakes. I mean, if you generate enough revenue, mistakes will be... I forget how I put it. It's one of the slides from yesterday. And that's, in essence, we made so much money so quickly the people, you know, uh, um, I think I, I remember giving 10% to somebody in one of our subsidiaries. He never even cashed it in. He, uh, we wound up firing him. He left, didn't get a lawyer, didn't do anything. He's uh, some weasel guy, uh, engineer, a petroleum engineer, that w was selling our prospects to somebody else. I forget why we got fired, but anyway. Because he would have, for him to have been a 10, in hindsight, I guess, for him to have been a 10% shareholder of one of the subsidiary companies, he would have had a deal to all the people that hated him that knew that he had been a turncoat. So he just walked away from the equity. Because being 10% owner of a company is like kissing your sister. It means nothing unless you sell the company. And that's why everybody was interested in it because they knew that I sold assets. If you're going to hold on to your assets and hug them to death like a teddy bear, you're not going to get much, in, as my coal miners used to say, much incentive from, uh, it's not going to give them much incentive. But if you're a shaker and mover and they know you're going to roll assets and sell and buy and then own something to somebody, is, is a big deal. People like to own minority interest in things that I own because they know I'm going to roll them. Take them public, sell them, stuff them, do something with them. But I sure is not going to hug them all my life. But if you got, you know, if you just got a little teeny business, you're just going to nurture and, you know, let it suck on your breast for the rest of your life, then giving away equity in that doesn't mean anything. So, I mean, it's part of the transformation you've got to make. And you've got to walk your talk and they've got to believe you because employees know when you're bullshitting them. They know. They get back there in the coffee room or wherever, and they just know, that's a load of crap. That ain't going to happen. You know, and they just go back to their old ways, you know. 4.30, they get down like track stars, to the elevator, get run down. So, I mean, that's how I should have answered it yesterday. And the reason, I guess, the reason I fumbled about it yesterday is because it never happened to me. And then I thought about why. Because we were, you know, we did so many deals, giving away equity to somebody that wound up not being good. And I try to think how many times I was wrong. Maybe I was wrong three or four times in 15 years. And I was right in 50. And those three or four, maybe I would have made an extra, thinking like, 
the, the cheap screw here on the on the squawk box yesterday. I, it probably cost me. I don't know. I have no way of quantifying. It. Maybe a couple million dollars. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, it was so it was de minimis though. I mean, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. So that that's my answer. But getting back to this, you have your people put these together because and then they run them. You don't. And then they come back and they, 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 they tell you, however you have them report to you, you know, quarterly, bi-monthly or whatever, once a month, and this is where we stand. And then, and then these lines will change if you do it this way, because then maybe this will be turned into dots because no timeline's perfect. I mean, just like numbers aren't perfect. I mean, none of these things, just because you put it down doesn't mean it's, this is concrete. That doesn't, the God didn't put these, this isn't the Ten Commandments. And so they change. But what, you don't want them changing where there's, when you look, there's no resemblance. There's no semblance of order. You want them to be reasonably close. Right, Ed? You bet. Yeah. yeah, yeah uh, Mike, please, for Mr. Legrand. Where's the mic? Yeah, just keep them. Yeah, on the bottom. Question, uh, do you uh, give away equity all the way down to the bottom, all the way to, through all of your employees yeah, or just well, your uh, executives or what? When, when, uh, before we went public, I gave equity down to, um, we only had, you know, 14 employees before we went public. I gave equity down to everybody. After we went public, but that was a small number, after we went public and we had a lot of employees, I gave stock options all the way down to the receptionist, the guy that parked the car, my chauffeur. We didn't call him chauffeur because his dad looked really bad in a prospectus. We called him something else. But um, I, I forget what he was. Transportation Yeah, he was something. He was something. Personal yeah, assistant. Yeah, I think he was. PA, personal assistant. So we, we gave it all the way down the line. And I, and I tell the story. Uh, one of the happiest days of my life was when the day that um, Leanne Zakelli, who's now running one of my companies, who was my administrative assistant for 10 years, um, the, uh, she bought her house with the options from when we were a public company and then she churned in some more options and she expanded her house and built a new kitchen or I forget what the hell she did and uh, and you have no idea what that does to the employee the ranks first of all everybody in the company knows it they knew it before I did I mean everybody and we had a lot of employees all over the United States and in Great Britain everybody knew about it and of course, we had a newsletter, uh, I forget what it was called, but Leanne was the editor of it. And of course, she put it in the newsletter, which I, for those of you that have enough employees, I, I, I would recommend that highly. A newsletter, I mean, because, I mean, they will pump more smoke up themselves about you and your, I mean, and your, and your, and your successes than you would ever, you would be, I wouldn't be, you wouldn't be embarrassed to write about yourself, but most people would be embarrassed to write about themselves. But I mean, they, and so, you have no idea how it becomes infectious and or when the, you know a, a low-level employee uh, turns in options and buys a new car or what I mean and it always gets exaggerated sometimes a guy had only get, put two thousand dollars down on a twelve thousand dollar car by the time it got around the company you know he bought the car cash that's good you know I mean it's not your fault that that because I'm not spreading the rumor and, and and good news just like bad news has a way of expanding and pretty soon, I mean, it's, it's bigger than life itself. So, um, but this, th this is critically important to have them as part of it, doing it themselves, and then continually measuring it. You have them continually measuring and modifying it. The one that uh, Jim Mosby does for us, uh, I know there's changes, things change from, you know, that we're going to be in the 20 day period and now they're in the 30 or vice versa because he's continuing to modify because you've heard me say it time and time again, business isn't static, life's not static. So you continually to measure it as opposed to that plan you put in the top drawer.